Hello everybody, I'm Emily Skews, I'm sorry I'm a bit late, Central Line was a little bit down, or Circle Line. Um, so I'm Emily Skews, you may recognise me uh, from the first session you ever did, I was standing being Glamorous Assistant while Paul was teaching, this time our roles have reversed, I will be teaching and Paul will be my Glamorous Assistant, uh, <laughs> he gracefully curtsied. Um, I'm also a part of a structural engineer from Ramble, part of the computational design team, and today, as part of week seven, we will be looking at uh, Galapagos, which is a sort of optimization part of Grasshopper. So, optimization is quite a big topic. It's uh, something that comes up a lot when you're doing problem solving, especially in engineering or in architecture. When we have problems, they often have multiple parameters that ap apply to the solution. Many people that have different opinions of what they need or different requirements, and often it's quite a big juggling act to come up with the optimal solution which fits all of those people's criteria. And uh, probably one of the most commonly known examples that's used a lot in these kind of things is bone, where obviously it's, it's needed to be structural, needs material so that it's strong, but also needs to be lightweight so that you know, the human body is not, so that you don't have to carry all that excess weight around. So that's kind of the idea of optimization and what we've got to do. And luckily for us, already built into Grasshopper, very kindly, thanks David, uh, has built in a tool called Galapagos, which is a sort of optimization uh, component which allows us to run two different kinds of sort of meta heuristic algorithms, uh, which I will explain in more detail in uh, in further along in the week. But what we're going to do is we're going to start by setting up the problem that we have, and then uh, then as we start to run the solution, I'll explain a little bit more about in detail about the sort of background about each of the the algorithms, and feel free to just. Put your hand up, and Paul will come and help you help you out. So, today the problem that we're going to look at is something that hopefully we, as structural engineers, that we look at a little bit. We're going to look at a a I beam, or in the case in further on, we'll look at a series of I beams, and how we can optimize this I beam uh, based off playing with its different flange depths and widths, and the same with the web of how we can optimize that for weight given a certain problem. So we want it, first of all, to solve the problem of not deflecting too much, but also we don't want it to be super heavy. So we're going to optimize it for two things. So we can go into Vino in Grasshopper. Like so. Actually, I don't think we can do that. So first of all, we can start off with the four parameters which we're going to use to define our I beam section. So first of all will be our total depth. This is something that sometimes is quite important because you have limited space which you can put your beam in, but it might be different per different projects, uh, but it's something that you may want to control. So first of all we can uh, select create a slider. So either you can get the slider out of the input class or if we want to do the shortcut hand method to creating a slider, you can double left click on the grasshopper canvas. and Currently, Rhino in this Rhino is set into millimeters, but let's change it into meters because we're working with beams. Um, so if in Rhino you right-click on the little millimeters part on the bottom here and change your unit settings so that it's in meters. Like so. so everyone's working in the same units. Now... Probably for our total beam depth, we can guesstimate a kind of range that we're going to be working within. So if what we do is we set a total depth which ranges between, say, 200 mil deep, I mean, that's quite shallow, but just in case, uh, to maybe something like 1.5 seems like a, a reasonable range to have. And we probably want it to be with one decimal pay place. So what we can do, if you double left click, you could type 0 0.2 and then double left double dot even, and then 1.5, and press enter. You should get a nice slider which is now automatically set between 0 0.2 and 1.5 with one decimal place between them. And if you right click and rename that slider the total depth, which 
and things. So the other parameters that we could apply, in this case, we're going to go for a completely symmetric I beam, just save ourselves a little bit of hassle. But for example, if you wanted to make the script more robust, you could create parameters for have differences in the top and the bottom flange. But in this case, we'll keep it the same. Uh, so first thing that we're going to want is uh, the width of our web. So again, in this case, we might want to allow for a little bit more uh, decimal places in order to have a little bit more like play on what kind of control we have. So if you double left click, so we could say that we want it between sort of 10 mil and 100 mil as a kind of range of thicknesses of steel, some of them getting a bit thick, but we can go with that. Uh, so again, we can follow the same rule. If you double left click on the canvas, type 0 0.01, which will be for 10 mil all the way to 0 0.1. That will give us a nice slider with a range we might be more useful for us. Uh, so if you call that web width, and we can probably copy and paste that one for the, the depth of the flange because we're probably gonna be working within a similar kind of range there. So you control C, control V, you can have the same one, or you can do the same process of double left clicking into things, but this time call it flange depth. Ooh. That's about wrong. And the last parameter that we're gonna need is flange width. Again, this one we maybe would like a bigger range of numbers, so we could go from somewhere between uh not point two to 1.5 again as a kind of range. So we could even copy the total depth slider from a before if you so wish, or if you double left click and say 0 0.2, double dot 1.5. And rename that one flange width. So these are all in meters, so they're all quite small. So now we have our sort of main inputs of how we can draw a, or the, the parameters that control our eye section. Uh, the reason I haven't done one for web depth is because generally when we're trying these kind of problems, the depth is something that's more often set. And so we actually want the sort of web to be, the web depth to be something that's calculated rather than something that's a variable. Uh, so it allows us to be in control of, of the total depth that we have. So what we need to do is we need to calculate what that web depth is. And uh, we can do that by taking our total depth and minusing our flange, to, well, two of our flange depths from that total depth in order to calculate it. Um, so what we can do is we can, first of all, multiply our flange depth by two. So if you go to the maths tab in the operators, you have all of your nice maths operators, so we can use the multiplication. And into A, we can use our flange depth. And into B, uh, we will be good people and keep our parameters outside of, and not embed it into the input itself in order so that we can see very easily what is the input and so we can very easily read the script that we're writing. So if you double left click, we can bring up a panel tab so you can put on the speech marks, bunny ears, whatever you call them, like so. And in this case, because we're doubling it, we can just put in the parameter two. And if you keep that on your canvas, the other way you can do it is by using the panel component and then manually putting that in and setting that up into B so that we have our result of our total flange depth. And then we can use the subtraction component, again in the maths tab, in the operators drop down. And in that case, our A will be our total depth, and um, from that we will minus our double that we've just calculated using the multiplication. Like so. so we can group that component, and we can call that web depth, like so, just so we know where that is, and we know that it's somewhere within our script.
So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start to draw out the rectangles, one for the f each flange and one for the central web. And because of the way that we're going to set it up, we're going to, because it's symmetrical, we're going to assume that we know where the neutral axis is. If you were making this more robust, you could go in and do the full parallel axis theorem process to calculate where the neutral axis is and then follow on to find out the I value. But in this case, because we are keeping the flanges the same, we know it's symmetrical and we know that our, our neutral axis will be in the center. Um, and we're going to set that center to be on the origin and it just makes things a little bit easier for us. Maybe something to consider if you're wanting to make this a more robust script. Um, so what we can use is we're going to use in the curve uh, tab in uh, Oh, where am I going? There. In curve, what we want to use is we want to use the in primitive drop down. We want to use the rectangle component. So the rectangle component allows us for the first of us to put in a base plane that we want to use. And currently, it defaults to the world x y plane. But actually, we're going to do it so that it's set on the front so that it means that we can keep our xy plane can be where our beam center line is and then we can uh, draw things. So what we can use is we can get another xy plane. So if you double x click, click and type xz, you can get an xz plane automatically because it already has what some set up. <coughs> and add that to the canvas. We can leave the origin where it is and then put that plane into so 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 now if you go into Rhino you'll see in the front viewport i.e. where the XZ component is you'll now see the rectangle whereas previously you would saw the rectangle in the top viewport so now the inputs for the rectangle are, are a domain and because we're wanting to keep the centroid of our um, section as being in 0, 0, 0, what we're going to do is we're going to create a domain which is negative half of the width in one direction and half of the width in the other direction, and the same with the depth. So what we can do, first of all, we're going to need a lot of division twos. So we can go back to the maths tab in the operators drop down and use our division. And again, we're going to be dividing by 2, so 2 can be our go into B, because it's going to be our divisor. And the first one we can do is for the web width. And we can copy and paste that and do the same with the web depth. So now you have that. Now we can set up a uh, domain. So in the same maths tab, you'll see there's a domain drop down which has various ones that you can use uh, to create domains. And what we're going to want is to construct a domain in this case. So that's the first one up at the top. And essentially what that does is it allows you to put in two numbers which defines your domain. And so in our case, we're going to do the negative width and positive width. So we already have the positive web width. Uh, but now we're going to need the negative one. So again, in the maths operator one, uh, we can use the negative component, which is again in operators in the maths tab. And we can input our web width divided by two that we already have into the negative so that we have both the negative and the positive of that case. And so that means into the domain we can put in our negative of a half our width into A and the positive version into B. And we should have a nice, if you hover over the output for the domain you should get depending on what numbers you've put in. In my case, it is 
minus 0 0.005 to minus to 0 0.005. And so we can do the same for our web depth. So we already have our web depth divided by two. So if you use the negative component again, plug that in and create another domain component. Really, really small. <laughs> And you plug that into the X and Y of your rectangle. You may want to increase your uh, web width a little bit so that it's not so tiny, if you're like mine. And so we can group our rectangular component and we can call it our web. So we know where that is. Now we're going to do the same with the flange, which is. So again, we need to take the flange width and uh, the flange width itself doesn't need to be divided by two because we're not using that as a central part. That will stay the same. Uh, but for the flange dip depth, we will need to use, uh, again, the division component and divided by two. So in the operators tab, division. You can input your flange depth into A, and then the number two component that we already have in our panel into B. And then do the negative of that, either by doing this. And then do the same for the flange width. Hopefully everyone has that. And then we can use the domain components again to create our two different domains of the X and Y coordinates for our web uh, flange, I'm sorry. So you can use the construct domain component again using the negative half of your flange width and the same for your flange depth. So hopefully that should be pretty similar for both. And then we can use the rectangular component again. What do you think of? in curve primitive and use rectangle. Again, we want it in the same plane so we can use our same x, y, x, z plane component to P. Currently what we have is our flange, but it's currently sitting in our central plane with the central ray. So what we want to do is we want to be able to move it twice, once up so that it's at the top of this beam and the second time down so that it's in the, the bottom of the beam so that it's top and bottom flanges. Uh, so what we can do is we can use our move component. And for the first time to move it up, what we're going to have to move it up by is in the Z direction by half of the web depth, which we already have because we've already calculated that, and then plus by another half of the flange depth itself. <laughs> so what we can use there here for this, so first of all, we will get our web depth divided by two, which is should be over here, and your flange depth divided by two, which you've got over here, and we can add those together using one of the maths operators again. 
If you didn't know where the maths operators were, you will now after this session. Um, so in the maths operators tab, there is the addition. And so the two that we can add together is our web depth divided by two and our flange depth also divided by two. And then what we can use is we can use the unit Z component, i.e. The, the component to move it up to create a vector in the Z direction, uh, and use this as the factor in that to move our flange up. So in vector, in the vector tab, in the vectors drop down, you'll see there's obviously vector X, Y, Z, which would be useful if we were moving in multiple directions. But because we only want to move in the Z direction, you can use unit Z by itself. And you can use the output of our addition into the factor. And so if you hover over the V output, you'll see that you get a vector that's going up in the same amount. And we can connect that into our move component. And you'll suddenly see you now have a T-beam, with a, still with the funky beam on the bottom. But so if we put that higher up in our script so that maybe it's above the web so it's quite easy to see which one is which. So we can group that one and call it top flange. Now obviously we want to do the flange that's on the bottom. So it's a similar kind of process. We already have our vector but what we can use is the negative component to switch a vector because Grasshopper is smart that you don't have to, doesn't just have to be on numbers, it can also be on vectors. Um, so if you use the negative component either by double clicking or in the maths tab in operators, whoop, yeah. you can connect your, set, your vector that's been moving in unit V and create another move component And connect the same rectangle that you use that's currently sitting in the center of your your beam to here and move it using the negative vector and you should now have an eye beam and we can group that last one call it bottom flange And we can take the, the flange rectangle that's in the center of our beam and we can de-preview that. It's essentially been a piece of construction geometry that we now no longer, no longer need. So to do that, if you select the item and right click in the center of it and do you click the preview button, you should now have your eye beam set up like so. Hopefully everyone's got that. Now we're going to start testing your engineering knowledge <laughs> and start uh, doing some things. So hopefully all of you, have they learned, I assume they've learned parallel axis theorem. Learned parallel axis theorem? No? Yes? Yes. Yes, you have. Okay, good. <laughs> well, if you're not, you haven't, then this is going to be a quick reminder and a good, <laughs> good little double, you know, dual purpose, grasshopper teaching and structural engineering combined into one, one, one example. So to help ourselves a little bit, actually Grasshopper has a nice little component which if you give it a certain closed geometry, either being a surface or a closed curve, it is able to calculate various uh, items of data for it. You've maybe already used the area and volume components, uh, but what we can use here, if you go to the surface tab in analysis, uh, you'll see that down here there's various components that you can use to uh, gather information from geometry that you have. Um, so you can get the area or the volume, or the one that we're going to use is area moments, like so. So what this takes in is a piece of geometry. So in this case, we're going to do one for each of our top flange, bottom flange, and our, our web. And what it outputs is the area of the geometry, which we're going to need for, this, for the equations. Uh, also the centroid, which is pretty useful. We already have that kind of calculated, but we can get all of this out easily and also the I value which for a rectangular should be relatively simple um, but for more complex shapes this may be quite useful. No, not simple. <laughs> so 
what we can do is we can input our top flange geometry into, into G. And if you now hover over our output A, you get a nice area. C, what you'll see is a centroid, which is um, actually set up as a vector, because obviously this is set up in 3D space. And so you can, uh, you know where it's pointed in 3D space. So the one that's more interesting for us is obviously the Z component, because that's its relation to where the neutral axis is. And I is obviously the moment of inertia, and it's based about, in our case, we want the x-axis one because it's the one in the x-axis direction. So we have that, so we can copy and paste that three times well, we, for each of the top, bottom, and top and bottom flange and the web. Ooh. And so as I said, we need to be able to get out certain items of the information from the vectors that we have as, that are coming out. So for the centroid, we want to get the Z, Z component of it. So we need to decompose the vector that is being outputted from the component. So if you go into vector, the vector tab, and on the vector drop down, there is a component called deconstruct vector, which allows you to input a, com a vector and it be broken down into its component parts. So if you link your output C into the vector output, you'll suddenly see if you hover over X, there'll be zero, Y will be zero, and Z will be the information that we want, which is not point. Which technically we don't actually need because we've already calculated, but I was just showing you for the fullness of that component. <laughs> And in order to make it a little bit clearer for us we, about which information that we want, we can use uh, the number parameter, which you can get from the params tab in the geometry, in the primitive drop-down. Uh, you should be able to get the number parameter component, which is in things. So these inf pieces of information, also, these components are useful for storing information to help it make your script a little bit clearer. So if you use the number component and link our Z into there, and then we can group that and call it distance from centroid. And then we can use another deconstruct vector, so you can copy and paste the one that's already on your page, but instead of having the centroid C output, have the I output into there and use another parameter, uh, number parameter component for our x component, which will, if you group it, will be our local i value for that rectangle. So you call it ITF or whatever makes it clear that that's what it still is. And so now we can do the same for both the top flange, the web, and the bottom flange. So you could take those four components, copy and paste them down into the four, into your different parts, and connect your equivalent centroid into your top decompose vector, and then the same with the eye. You'll notice that for the web, it will be zero because we've set it up so that the centroid is at the same place, so you technically don't need to do that, but you could do it for if you're wanting to create more complex geometry and you're wanting to, you know, have if your neutral axis is in a different position. Ooh. And then you can rename the labels for your I val local I values so that your 
Thanks. So for the last bit of parallel access theorem, we're not going to use a component which tells us our i for us. We're going to do a little reminder <laughs> of what, how to calculate i values, which is essentially with where your local i value of each rectangle and how it's related to the centroid that we so have and the distance that it's from that it is from there. So hopefully you know this equation. Um, so rather than sometimes often having to write out multiple of the maths operators out to create a component, there is a quite useful tool called expression, which uh, if you look, if you type expression into things, which I don't know if you've come across before, but it's very, it's often quite useful because it allows you to write in an equation or an expression into a format so that you're, you can very easily read what, what your component is doing and input into that. So for the parallel axis theorem, we're wanting to use the equation, well, we want to sum up the I value plus the area of each rectangle and its distance from the centroid squared. So we're going to need three inputs for our input. So if you zoom in to the expression component, you'll see the nice little extra out, uh, pluses and minuses pops up. And so we can add another input very easily. And if you right-click the first x component, we'll rename that to being A, i.e. for our area. And we'll change Y to being I for our local I values. And Z will change to D, i.e. our distance from our centroid. Now, if you double left click on the center of the expression component, this will pop up and you can see all the various operators that you can use. Um, but what you can do is we can write in the format that we need. So in our case, uh, it will be I plus A multiplied by D squared, which you can use the operator drop down here, which already has a squared one set up. So it's simpler than other things. But if you want to do it to more than you've got your multiple thing here. And if you press OK, you'll see it goes bright red because you have no inputs. But quite nicely here, you can read the equation or the expression that you've set out. And so it's, quite, it's sometimes easier than having multiple of the maths operators in one go. Uh, so in our case, what we can do is we already have the area for each of them. Our D and our I, we can link it in. And we can use that same expression component again for the ones below, but just rechange the inputs that are going in. And now what we want from that is to sum them all together so that we get our total I value for the whole section. Um, so we can use the nice mass addition component, which again is in the math tab operators, mass addition. And what we can do is connect each of those ones for our top flange, bottom flange, and our centroid into there. And if you want to put multiple inputs into the same component, you press shift at the same time. And we can group that one and call it I value. I cannot type. Now we have our I value, we can now use that for doing various calculations. So in this case, what we're going to do is calculate deflection and use that I value to work out what our deflection was going to be. But as I said earlier, what we're also going to do is we want to optimize for the mass of the beam. So we could do a solution where we find an I value which works, but we have our client wanting to save money and uh, 
you know we want to use as le little steel as possible but as well as well as fitting our deflection criteria so we also want to know our mass of our beam um, so what we can use is we obviously have all of our areas so another output that we want is the total area of our section um, so we can use another mass addition component but this time add all the area into there in the same way and we could name that group that and name that area So now what we need to do is actually have a beam that we can spread this along. So first of all, we're just going to make this a little bit more visual so you can kind of very easily see. Um, so if in your top view in Rhino, you draw a line that's running along parallel to the um, y-axis. Be however long, maybe not too long. And we want to bring that curve that we've got in Rhino into Russell. So imagine you're, you have a plan which you have some beams on and you want to bring some in. So what we can use is in the parameter or params tab in geometry, there's a parameter component called curves. And to bring in that line geometry from Rhino into, uh, into Grasshopper, you can right click on the center of the curve component that you have and bring in set one curve, press set one curve, and then you can select the curve that you've just drawn. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that I section we're going to, that we already have created, we're going to move it to the start point of that curve and extrude uh, the section along so that we can kind of very visually see what we have. But then also what we're going to need is information like the length of that curve in order to work out the total mass so that we can use that as one of our things to optimize for in a second. So if you have your curve, uh, first, we want to get the start and end points. So if you go to curve, and use the end points component in order to get the start and end points. Because our section is currently drawn at 0, 0, 0, uh, what we can do is we can use a move component and the start point location as a vector in order to move that uh, rectangle onto that location. So if we get a move component, and the geometry we want to move is obviously the rectangle that represents the top flange, the web, and the bottom flange. So we can group all of those three parts of the geometry into one by using a geometry parameter component, which again is in the parameters tab in geometry drop down. So we can put all of those three pieces three pieces of geometry in. And if you press shift at the same time so that you can have them all connected into the one part. Mm -hmm. So that's the geometry that we're going to move. So if you take that and input that into G and use the start point from your curve, it 
So, and now we can use the extrude along curve component in order to take that set of geometry and extrude it along so that we can see it. So if you double left click and type extrude, there's the one that's called extrude along. It's also in surface tab. And that input wants, first of all, a curve or a surface input that you're going to extrude, and then the curve that you want to extrude along. So we have our newly nicely moved eye section and the curve that we've inputted brought in from Rhino. Now what you should have is a nice little eye beam. And also the information that we want is we actually need to know the length of that uh, length of that beam. Um, so there's a nice length component in Grasshopper which allows you to take a curve and get the length out from it. If you take the curve, our input curve to length, then we have the length of it here. If you move your length component so that it's close to your area component, uh, what we can use is we can use a um, multiplication thing to calculate uh, the vo total volume of that beam and therefore times it by the unit weight of steel in order to work out what the mass of it is. So if you use a multiplication component in, again in the maths operator tab you can use the area that you've got in your big area and the length to calculate the volume and again you could have done this by creating the volume and then adding using the volume component to calculate it but many ways to do the same thing in Grasshopper so, and now we have our volume and we need to times it again, multiply it by the weight of steel. So if you use another multiplication, and we can use the unit weight of steel, which is handily written down on my notes, um, which is 7,850 7, kilograms per meter cubed. So you can use a panel component because this is something that's going to stay the same probably unless, I don't know, some manufacturing thing changes significantly and the molecular layout changes um, with the number 700 and 7,850 in And so we can group that and we can be like mass. So now we have lots of information of, from our beam that we can use. And the last thing that we have to do is calculate how much that beam is deflecting. Um, so for that, we're going to need a couple of inputs. The first one is the tributary area, which that beam is picking up. And the second one is the load as an area load that may be from you know, the build, floor build up, whatever decking you have, and the live load that you so have, so we need two more parameters. Uh, the first one, we can create a slider. It probably will only need one decimal point, but it will be somewhere between five and 10 for our area loading. So in let's in our case, let's choose 8.5. I'm just pulling this number. You can choose wherever you, whatever you like. And we can call that area load. And we're going to say we have a nice panel system which is only built up in integers. So we can say that it has a tributary, this beam has a tributary area that it's picking up of four meters, so two meters on either side, four meters in total.
So we can now use those two numbers to calculate the UDL along that beam. Um, so simply again, we can use the multiplication component to do the area load times by the trib area in order to calculate what the UDL is along that beam. And then we can use a simple beam deflection equation. Well, it's not that simple, but it's very simple. I won't see if you, I won't test you guys and see if you know it off the top of your head. If you do, you can shout out and we can, <laughs> we can see. But uh, otherwise, because again, it's one of those quite complex expressions, we can use the expression component because that will allow us to very clearly be able to see what we've written and uh, rather than having to have many different math operators. Um, so if you get another expression component up, uh, the inputs that we're going to need for that are, well, if you remember the equation, it's 5WL to the 4 divided by 384EI. Uh, you're all nodding. You didn't call it out, though. <laughs> Cheats. <laughs> um, so as our inputs, what we're going to need is uh, a few more of these inputs. So we're going to have four inputs, which will be W, L, E, and I. So if you zoom in again and the little plus signs come up and get two more of those, and if you change your X to being W for our UDL load, uh, Y to L to be the length of our beam, Z you can change to E, which will be the Young's modulus of steel, and I, which is the I value that we will have calculated already for our section. And then if you double left click on the format part, we can set up the equation. Uh, so what we need is 5 times by W, which we have, times by L, and then you can use the little operator thing up here, i.e. the little hat sign, so the 4, there's brackets, and then we divide that by 384 times by E times by I. And you press OK, again, it will complain. Um, so first our W, which we already have just calculated over here, is our UDL. You can go in. L is the length of our beam, which we've got somewhere quite far away now <laughs> from where I put it. E of steel. I bet all of you start nodding when I say the number. Or do you going to say that? <laughs> you going to say it. <laughs> so, Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> uh, so it, some people use it, say, 2 GPA, or some people use it sort of or 200 GPA, or somewhere to so we'll say 205, someone say 2010. We'll go with slap bang in the middle with 205. Um, so if you use your panel, panel component and use 205, now, obviously, because of the units that we're working in, uh, we're going to have to convert it. I'm just going to tell you the conversion, um, but you can go through and check with at some point if you were working it out, but that's something you have to take care of when you're doing this. So we can use another expression component. This time we only need one input, so we can use the little Z things. And if you double left click, what we can say is X times by 10. Ooh. That's an 8 times 10 to the power of 6, so that we're in kilonewtons per meter. So, and you can link that into E. And then I, you can link in uh, the I value that we calculated earlier. And we can group that and call it deflection. Ooh. Ooh. Or delfection.
Okay, so now we have all of that. So now what we want to do is we want to create a deflection limit which that uh, beam is allowed to deflect by. Um, so that's another input that we can have. So we want to set up another slider for a beam. We can say, for example, 250. That may change depending on what you have. And we can call that slider deflection limit. What we can do is we can take the length and divide it by that deflection limit to calculate what is the maximum deflection we can have. So we can use the division math component, which is in the maths tab operators, like so. And we can take the length of our beam and divide it by our deflection limit. So now what we're going to do is we have all of the information that we need, but we now need to start to run our optimization to work out whether... Um, so there's two things that we want to fit within the criteria that we have. First of all, we want our deflection to always be less than, obviously, the deflection limit, first of all, first and foremost. And the second of all, we want to try and keep it at that, but then also try and optimize the weight so the weight is as little as possible. So this is where Galapagos can come in. And so Galapagos is an optimization component, which is in the parameters tab in utilities. You'll see down here, there's a whole little set down here, which the second one from the bottom is called Galapagos. And if you put that onto your script, you'll see a component that looks slightly different from ones that maybe you've seen before. Uh, it does, like as per usual, have little nodules that are on the end, but uh, the first one is called genome. Uh, which is on the side, which is your input, and it's essentially an input, but essentially it's telling you, well, it's telling Galapagos, obviously, what are the parameters that it's allowed to change and play with. And the one on the bottom, which is fitness, which unusually is at the bottom, not usually the component, is the score that uh, your component is, is or your solution has as a, as a score. So what we need to do is we need to set up a score for our... Um, for our beam process. So in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to use two parts of what we've calculated. First of all, the mass, uh, which is something that we want to optimize and i.e. minimize. But the other one that we need to do is obviously for it to not be deflecting too much in this case. So what we're going to set up is a system where if uh, it is deflecting too much, then it's going to create a score which is really, really high. So in this case, what we're going to want is a really low score. It's like horse riding where, you know, you want to get close to zero as possible, not, a, not as high as possible. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create what you could call a uh, factor which, you know, if, if it suddenly is failing, then it's going to multiply the weight by a huge factor so that it's, you know, it's telling the, the optimization that it's, got a really rubbish score essentially. So to do that we're going to compare our two deflections so we can use this smaller than component and essentially um, what we want to see is, is the deflection that we have from our beam so i.e. the one that's coming out of the expression is A into A and the deflection limit into B. And so what that does is that if you hover over the selection in our case, hopefully it should be true, or it might be false if it's failing. 
Um, but what we can say is that uh, Grasshopper changes booleans of true and false into zero and one. So we can use that to dispatch a list which has a factor either of one, if it's, uh, if it's passing, then it can be one, so that it keeps the same weight, or, or and then the other one being, I don't know, a thousand, we could say, for if, it's, uh, if it is failing. So what we can do is we can use a panel component. And if you double left click, we can first put in our factor for if it's false, so a thousand, so i.e. it's failing, and our second factor, which is one, if it's passing. And if you press enter, ooh, enter, or then if you don't press enter again, but if you left click on the canvas, you'll see it comes up with this. But what we need is it for to be in a list currently. Currently, it's written as a text box. So if you right click on the panel component, you'll see there's a drop down which says multi line data. So if you click that, you'll suddenly see it goes into a sort of list um, structure like so, which is what we need. And then we can use the dispatch component. Oh wait, no, we don't need the dispatch component. That's well, we could do it that way. Um, but what we're going to use is we're just going to use the list item component, which is in the sets tab in the list drop down. You can use list item. So the list that we're inputting is obviously our 1001, so our factors that we want to apply. And the i that we want to get is our true or false, so you can input that in. And because it's true, it will go to 1, but if it was false, it would go to 0. And so what we're doing is we're picking out the factor 1 in this case. So Currently now, weight is the only thing it's going to optimize, so that's going to give us a score. Now, Galapagos only allows you to have one fitness score. So, in some, so what we have to do is combine, if you have multiple things that you're optimizing for, you have to somehow combine them into one fitness factor function and one fitness score uh, in order to run the optimization. Um, this sort of fitness function could be something that's like high topic of how you set that up and it can be different for different problems. Um, but in the case of what we're going to do, we're just going to use a simple multiplication so that if it's set to one, then the number will be quite small. But if it's failing in terms of um, deflection, then it's going to make a really huge number because it's going to times the weight of the beam itself by a thousand. And if it's going to try and minimize that, then it's obviously going to realize something's wrong. Uh, so we can use the multiplication And we can times our mass by our factor that we have got based off whether it's passing or failing. And we can group that and call it fitness function. Now Galapagos works a little bit differently like I explained before. So we have our fitness, so what we can do is we can link that to the fitness function that we have. So if you uh, select the fitness nodule below the, in, on the component, you'll see a little nice green arrow comes in which you can point to the fitness function that we have. So it's a little bit different from what we had before. There you go. You'll see that now this like, little arrow is going kind of the opposite way than what we're used to. And then we can bring that component back to the front of our script and we can tell it which of the components, the, which of the sliders or parameters that we want it to control. So in this case we want it to be able to play with the web width, uh, the flange width and the flange depth because probably in the case the total depth is going to stay the same because maybe we have some kind of criteria um, but we can set it up so that it plays with those three. So if again what you do is you get the little nodule which is coming out of next to genome and you link it to one of the things, you'll see it brings a little red arrow out and it highlights the thing in pink, the parameter that you're using, and you do the same with flange width. Again, like normal components, you have to press, press shift in order to have multiple at the same time, or else it will just overwrite it. 
and you can do the same for flange width, flange web width and flange depth. And now we can start to go in and have a look at Galapagos itself. So if you now double left click on the Galapagos component, what you'll see is this options editor comes up. And the first um, page essentially allows you to set the parameters and your, your ideas. And we'll come back to this after I've explained the sort of behind the scenes of the algorithms so that it makes a little bit more sense. But the main thing that you'll probably want to know here is you can select the fitness here of whether you want it to maximize your score or go try and minimize the score. And in our case, we want the minimum amount of mass, so we want to change this to minimize, like so. And then you can drop over into the solvers tab, which is next on the left, and you'll see a few different things come up. Um, on this top bar here, you have the options of which solver you want to use. For the first case, we'll just use the genetic algorithm, which is this little pink ball one with the little tadpoles. Um, then, essentially, the only other thing for the moment that I'll show you is over here on the right, there are these uh, kind of dials as such. And essentially, that's allowing you to choose how many or how much of the different options that it's iterating through you see in Rhino and Grasshopper itself. So if you had it, so what we want to do is set it for that first one, i.e. display all of the geometries in the viewport. It just allows you to kind of see what's going on. If you don't actually want to see it and it's too computationally heavy, you can set it so that you don't see it so often and like that. So if you set that to display all geometries and then press start solver, hopefully what you should see is your beam going a little bit bonkers and changing size and doing stuff. Um, and then you'll start to think. So we'll come back to that in a second, but now I'm going to go and explain kind of behind the scenes while it runs for a little while um, what it's doing. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. So Galapagos runs off two different algorithms that you can use. First one is using genetic algorithms, and the other one is simulated annealing. So the first one is genetic algorithms, which I'll explain, and that's essentially copying what evolution has done for the past million years and allowing us to do it in a matter of seconds. So probably all of you have probably seen this image of Darwin's evolution of monkey to man, of how we got to where, where it is. And essentially, a genetic algorithm is trying to follow the same process. So what it does is it initially creates a giant solution space of um, options that you have based off playing with all the different parameters. So you have, I don't know, depending on what you've set up, you could have a thousand, you could have a hundred first species. And it scores each of those solutions based off your fitness function. And then based off the score that each of those have, it picks the top X percent, depending on what you've set up. And what it does is it makes those the parents and it breeds them, essentially. So imagine well, in this case, grasshoppers, you see they're in love over here. Thanks to Paul for setting up this nice diagram over here. Um, so it breeds, breeds all of these things, and creates a set of off offspring. Um, and then in order to try and you know, keep a little bit of randomization, it sometimes mutates those offspring slightly. So here you can see the radioactive uh, grasshopper down here where it's mutating it, you know, the Hulk or the giant green spider from your nightmares. Um, and then what it does is it takes all of those new results and it sort of rinses and repeats and it creates, it scores all of those results again, follows the same process, theoretically getting rid of all of those um, answers, getting rid of the solutions that were not so good and using all the best bits of uh, the parents that they had before to make the great human race that we have now. But essentially that's what it's trying to do in the, the, the system that it's trying to emulate. Now the other uh, algorithm is simulated annealing and that comes from, the concept behind that is how, why, when you temper metal, often it can be other materials, but how you control it so that you get the structure that you want. 
And the way you kind of imagine it is when you start, whatever you heat up the metal, all the atoms in 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 the metal are able to move around, jump around in order to find its new location. Um, and as it cools down, it cools down. Uh, the amount that the atoms can move gets smaller and smaller, essentially, and um, it bits and clusters of it get cooled down faster or slower, and it's able to sort of construct itself into the optimum um, structure because it's still able to move a little bit until it gets to the cool state where it's stopped and everything's frozen and it's stuck in a structure, and that temperature of cooling can be controlled in order to make that more optimum. So essentially, oh, it's called the genetic algorithm. That's supposed to say simulated kneeling on the top. Um, so essentially, what simulated is doing is it's similar to a hill climbing uh, op uh, algorithm where if you take the black line, which is essentially your solution space or your solution, all the possible states that you have, if you were taking a hill climbing algorithm, it would find the first solution and it would check its neighboring solution, which would be the one directly next to it by changing one variable. If it's better, it goes up the hill. If it's not, it stays where it is. And so the problem with hill climbing algorithms is that you can sometimes get stuck on local optima. So in the case of if it was just following this path, it would get stuck at the top here, and it would never go and find the optimal solution, which is over here. So the idea of simulated annealing is that it takes a little bit more randomness. So it follows the same process. You take your initial state, and then it calculates the fitness of a neighboring state, which, especially when it's hot as such, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the direct neighbor. It can jump quite far between the different states. And so in this case, from one to two. And if uh, the fitness function is better, then it automatically takes, okay, yep, I'm going up the hill. Um, but something that differs from the hill climbing algorithm is that when it checks the next one, if the, if the fitness function is lower, there is still a possibility for the um, for the algorithm to choose the solution that's worse, and that probability is based off the temperature. So when it's really hot, it still has a bit more kinetic movement to move, and also is related to how much of a loss in that fitness score you get. And there is an equation for it that's down here, um, but that's just sort of done in the background. And so the idea being that you can go down in order to go up you know, two steps backwards, ten steps forwards, or the opposite way around, um, with the idea that it allows you to reach an optimum peak, more likely. So you can see here that as it's getting colder and colder, it will move less and less, and hopefully the idea is that you'll reach the top here. So that's essentially the behind the scenes of the two, the two algorithms. So if we go back to... Ooh, it's done something I wasn't quite... Uh, if we go back to our thing over here. If we go back to the options, so if I just stop the solver, if we go back to the options here, um, what we have is the minimize. Now, the algorithm theoretically could run forever because it could continue, especially genetic algorithms could run until, you know, it could keep breeding, keep creating solution spaces. Um, so there's a few different inputs that you can have. Um, so Threshold is a setting that you can set, which is if it reaches this fitness score, then stop, essentially. Um, you can set a runtime limit, so if you wanted to, say, go and for a lunchtime meeting, uh, but you didn't want to leave this running, you could say, I want it to stop after half an hour, for example, or 30 seconds, whatever you so wish. Um, so these are different ways that you can do it. Um, but the way that the evolutionary genetic algorithm generally does it is if it has a stagnant result for, in this case, 50, then it will stop the algorithm. Now, the next one input is the population, and that's basically saying how many solutions does it create in each iteration for it to score. And in this case, we've got it set to 50. And so that means each iteration that it will do, it will create 50 results, it will score them, and then start breeding them as the process goes. The only exception that there is is at the beginning, where potentially, because you might have a very large solution space, you'll want an initial boost to in order for you to uh, create a larger set of 
solutions that you can score to make sure that you have hopefully answers in all spectrums of your answer so that you are able to hopefully come up with a better result. Um, so that's what the initial boost is, so you can set it to being, in this case, 2, so that means the original set would be 100. Um, and then the next two are maintaining and inbreeding. Uh, so, so essentially men maintaining is saying how many of, uh, what percentage of your population score are you going to take forward and keep uh, in the next situation. And inbreeding is a function of how close a solution so obviously when you have your fitness scores they're in a whole range and uh, this will define how many of them will go for fitnesses which are close by to them and so in this case it will be 75% will take will breed the breeding pair as such will be within a reasonably close range um, but you want to sometimes keep that not at 100% so that you bring in the randomness such uh, and then again, you have the same. You have simulated annealing, uh, where you have your temperature, which you set up generally 100 is good. Your cooling rate, so i.e., how much it cools each time for between each iteration and kind of the pace that you're iterating through. And then maybe the most interesting one is the drift rate, which is the percentage of or the likelihood that as you change your solution state how many variables it changes so typically it changes one variable um, but this gives a percentage that maybe it will change more variables you can kind of usually play around with these until to give you kind of an idea of it's good as you kind of play with these optimized things just kind of play with the variables to see what kind of impact it has obviously the population one if you increase it too much may kill your computer because lots of people, it will kill mine at work because it's, my computer's rubbish. But it's, uh, it obviously will implement, have effects on the computational time and things like that. Um, but often worth just having a play to see what the differences in results are. So if I start this solver again, you can go through it. So it's starting to see, so what you can see is it's wiggling around and now what that's doing is creating its original initial population. And what you can see here in this uh, tab here is what you can see is it's uh, is the sort of solution range that it's following. So if I stop that, so that it's following like so, and essentially it's turning the score. Then in this box down here, what it is showing you is the fitness score range. Ooh, like so here. and sort of the genetic similarity between the options. So currently all of them are kind of quite far away from each other. Um, but sometimes you get it where they all start to clump together and that would show that the genetic similarity between them is pretty similar or if you have two, two separate sections, let's say. Then if you have your middle one here, which is essentially the plot of your different slider values, which is, becomes a little bit more obvious if you look at the furthest right box, where if you select some of the options, i.e. what the score is, um, you will see your kind of slider solution space that it's picked here. And these are kind of all of your different uh, scoring options that you have, with the maximum one that's been able to achieve being here at the top and you can scroll down to see it. And so what you can do is if you want to select any of them, what you can then press is the reinstate button and what it will do is it will change the sliders to that solution. So it allows you that when you've created your solutions, because if you just press okay, it will go back to what it was before. So this allows you to go through and have a look at your different options uh, of how it's trying to minimize the weight that you have in this case. And in this case, pretty small like so now in the one that looks like a kind of jewel green jewel sparkly one that's for simulated annealing uh, you can start the same solver and it will do a similar thing where it starts playing with the size of your beams and this is showing you your solution space and down here on the bottom left is your temperature 
and that will keep descending lower and lower towards zero and you can stop it as and when you can so wish and again here on the right it has all of your different solution options which you can reinstate onto your slider as and how you so wish. Now one thing that you'll find is in this case we've only got two parameters that we're working towards um, and potentially you might have situations where there's probably going to be many many more not just you know your beam deflection and your weight but you'll also have to look at things like constructability so you may have an example where you don't just have one beam you have multiple beams in a in a structural system and as well as wanting to minimize the mass you don't want to have 25 different beam types because the contractor on site is going to come along and be like what are you doing I don't want all of these different ones I want uh, I want only three types and um, things so you can use this kind of tool to embed uh, those similar kind of implementations in to try and also optimize for those kind of answers um, which maybe we don't have time for but um, so if we press OK. So that's something to bear in mind when you're running these kind of solvers is that you have things. Um, and as you get more and more parameters being involved, often um, the solution that you get may not always reach the optimum. It may take ages for it to get to the optimum that maybe sometimes it's worth just using these solvers to start to kind of guide you into the direction of what you have because in this case if we were to put this on multiple beams we would get a solution which where we had 25 different beam types and then we may want to do a post process of where we go through and rationalize that so we only have five um, because quite often the solutions that we come up with uh, may be solving one problem but it may be impractical for other situations because of um, whatever reasons um, and so that will take some sort of post-processing and judgment to take the results that come out of genetic algorithms or, or these kind of processes to guide you as to your solution rather than taking the result that you have to be the finite answer that is correct because quite often there's other other parameters at play so what we can do is we could do we can create a very quick little system where we have a few different beams to try and see what it comes up with. So if you go back into Rhino and go onto your top view, um, what we're going to do is we're going to create, I don't know, say a slightly interesting bus shelter that just came up. Things. So we have the two ends of our bus shelters, which can be two, two lines, again, parallel to the y-axis. Set them to be a bit bigger. Be a very big bus accident. Bus, bus. And the re reason it's kind of a little bit more interesting is we're gonna. It's not just gonna be a nice straight rectangle. We can. It's got a nice funky geometry on in the lengths. The kind of looks something like this. Or let's just do like so. So it's a slightly funky. Uh, nice funky shape and so that means that when we have put our beams in that our, span, uh, our slabs are going to span onto that the beams are all going to be of different lengths and i.e. going to have different deflection answers and so therefore theoretically the, the, the optimization would come up with a different result for each of those and um, the contractor is going to shout at us so what we want to do <laughs> is <laughs> is we want to try and make it rationalize a little bit also for the different beam types. So we have our two different curves here. And so if we go down to here, we can use a parameter curve input. So and we can bring in those two curves. Uh, so if you select them both, or, or right click, on the center of your curve component and say multiple curves 
and select your two select your two curves press enter you'll have something like so and we want to split those curves up so that we have a nice even spacing um, so what we can use is the contour component and what that takes in is a curve to contour which we've got two of them so we can put that into there the contour starting point we got, we can set it to zero. You could set it to being the start point of one of your lines if you so wish. Um, the normal direction currently is set to zero one, but what we want is the distance between the contours, which we already have because we have a tributary area um, over here, which we have. Um, so what we could use, we could use that same trib area to be the spacing. And then we need to change the normal direction by using which will be the x-axis in this case. So what we can use is we can use the unit x component which is in the vector tab from the drop down so essentially what that's doing is it's creating a whole load of planes which have a normal vector in in the x direction and it's going along that curve and it's splitting it based off those contours And now currently what we have, because we've uh, put two curves into the one component, we have a tree data structure and we want to manipulate that slightly. So currently if you look at the uh, data structure, so you can do that by getting the param viewer out and connecting that into C. And if you right click and say draw tree, what you'll see is you have two branches, one which represents your first curve and the other one which represents the second curve and then each of the points along that curve. But what we're going to want to do is we want to link together the first point on the first curve with the first point on the second curve. So actually what we want to do is kind of flip that um, data around so that it's based off the index of the point rather than on the curves. So what we can do is we can use path mapper. We'll do this so that if you had more than one curve, this would be... Things which are interesting. So this is this little cube component here, which essentially allows you to manipulate tree structures. So currently, what we have is we have squiggly brackets, zero, semicolon, zero, or whatever number, as such. Um, so if you double left click, we can represent that structure as a semicolon a. I mean, squiggly brackets a, semicolon b. And what we want to do is we want to change it so that it's just looking at the curve. So if we set it to, oh, I keep missing the capital letter thing. The A is your target. Then what you'll see is that breaks that down into two lists. So essentially what it's doing is it's taking each of those branches and kind of flattening them within each branch. So that all of the individual branches that were in branch zero become one list. And then the same in branch one, all of the, all of the extra branches in branch one then become one list. So if you do that, now you'll just have a thing that looks like an antennae of a caterpillar or something. So. 
So now we have our two lists, and what we want to do is we want to uh, get the first item and the second item. So currently I've got it set as the contours of the tree, but actually what we want, sorry, is the parameters of, i.e. the point parameters on 3T as the tree coming in rather than the contour things we actually want the points and because we've got the t parameter we don't actually have the point itself we only have its parameter t we want to evaluate that curve so that we know which at value at parameter t what is actually the point location um, so what we can use is the evaluate curve component which is in the curve drop down in analysis here And what we can do is we can input our original curves into C and our newly mapped T parameters. Ooh, not quite worked. You'll see we have a little funky thing going on. And what you'll see is what we've got is we've got the input T parameters in coming in as a tree and the curves coming in as a list because we've got it set up so that it's because uh, it's coming straight from the list so currently what it's doing is for each of those curves it's trying to find um, the t parameters first from the first curve and then from the second curve on both of these curves individually so what we need to do is we need to put the curves into the same data structure as the t parameters i.e. we need to have two separate branches for each of those curves and to do that, we can graft that list. So if you right, left, right click on the C input, and you'll see there's a thing graft. And what you'll see is then the structure of the data is now in the same format as the parameters, and we have our points like so. And what we want to do is we want to connect the first point of the first set to the sec first point of the second set. Um, so what we can do is we can essentially split that tree in half, or we could shift the list. There's many ways to do, do the same thing. Um, but we can, in this case, we'll split the list because there's just two of them. Um, but if you, there was multiple, you may want to shift your list. For example, if you had three sets of funky beam geometry in your middle. Um, so if you go to the sets component to list, oh, sorry, into tree, uh, there's the split tree, which is the tree with the lightning bolt thing. And first we want to take that list of points because that's the tree that we want to split and then what we want to do is we want to create the map i.e. the map to which branch we want to split it at uh, so in this case we can set create a, pra a panel component which ex which maps out the branch structure so what we would do is set zero semicolon zero press enter So what you should have is all the positive ones should be your first set of lists and your second one should be your second set of lists. And what you can then do is use your line component of creating line between two points and create yourself a set of beams that run between those two sets. And now what we can do is we can use the same script that we've used before. We're going to have to manipulate it a little bit because of um, the different kind of structure that we now have. But essentially we can use the same set of lines uh, to do that. So in our original set of line beam line that we brought in, which is at the top of the script, uh, rather than 
because of the way this script works, it's currently working on an individual basis. So what we're going to want to do is make sure that each of those lines is not in a list as it currently is, but similarly to what we just did where we wanted to graft it, so i.e. the same process runs on each branch individually. So if we, first of all, graft that input and then link all our, our set of new lines in there, you can... So now you have a set of funky beams. But currently, all of these beams all will follow the same parameters. So if, if this parameter of flange width changes, which you can do manually here, all of them will do it in one go. And all of them will be the same. And so the idea of our... This may not be exactly the, the right case. You really would want a situation where you had... 500 beams, for example, that you wanted to optimize, but in this case, things. So what we can do is we can use uh, one of these inputs within the sort of Galapagos family, which allows us to have multiple sliders for the same thing. So if you go to your parameters tab in the utilities component, there's a component called gene pool. which if you uh, come up, put on your canvas, it brings up a whole series of sliders, or like one long list of sliders, which you can play with. And it works in a very similar way to how a slider works. So if you double left click, you can then start to manipulate the maximum minimum range of those sliders. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll just let it play with one of the parameters so we could say we'll let it affect our what should we choose our flange depth for example um, so the same we want to set our minimum and maximum to be similar to what we set before so our flange depth before we said would be anywhere between 10 mil and 100 mil so we can do the same here so we can set the minimum to be 0.01 and the maximum to be 0.1 and have two decimal places and then the only thing that's different here is the gene count which essentially says how many in that box of things how many sliders do you want um, so in this problem what we would probably want to do is set it up so that it's got exactly the same amount of genes as we have beams um, if you wanted to make it more robust you could set that gene count to be something say like a hundred and then run a sort of shortest list thing so that it only ever affects the however many items that you have. But in this case, because we can very easily count how many we have, we can just set the gene count to being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven in my case. And so what we can do is we can take the flange depth and all the inputs. So if you're wanting to um, steal the inputs from one component to the another, you can... Oh, where's my... Yeah. Oh, can't press the right thing today. You can steal all the same inputs from there. Why can I not do this? By pressing Control and Shift at the same time. And so you can take control and shift and you'll see if you take all the stuff from flange depth you can move it into there like so now what you'll see is currently not very not everything is changing individually yet Ooh. Uh, what we need to do is we actually need to affect the data a little bit because of the, again, the setup that we have, is that we need to, with these top flanges here, the rectangles that create the flanges and the web, currently it's still in the list format, so again, we need to graft it all. So if on the outputs of your flanges you set, you graft all the inputs, Ooh. slowly, it'll do something kind of funny. If 
you graft all of those. Now you have all of your things which are all coming in and there is another thing that we need to graft. Um, so what's happening is now all of those geometries are going in into there and moving like so, each individually. And we have so we have that grafted up there and what the last thing that we need to graft is and what we'll need also is currently our fitness function uh, will be set up so that it's got multiple answers coming out currently because it's taking the information from each of those beams so we can keep it being the same that if each of those beams is failing but what we need to do is we need to accumulate all of that information into one number so that it works with Galapagos so what we're going to do in this case is we're going to do um, a like uh, mass addition of that number to calculate the total mass of all of those beams in one fell swoop so we can use the mass addition tool that we used before to move that into there and because currently they're all grafted, the mass addition will work in the sense that it will take one branch and it will mass addition all of them. So what we need to do is we need to flatten that in order to create one answer and one number for the fitness function. Essentially, so that's one of the ways that what you can do is to use those functions to kind of be able to manipulate multiple pieces of data is by using these kind of gene pools. Um, but it will, you will then need to sort of go in and create a function which defines how many are different if you were going to do a sort of optimization for um, the different kind, how many numbers of different beams you have. You would need to do a fitness function to do to calculate how many of those beams are the same and therefore use that output as something that you can then um, manipulate and use as part of your fitness function. So you could do it as, for example, that uh, you could create a sort of exponential system. So, you know, you were, it would times the fitness score by a smaller number if it's only got two or three numbers, but if it's gone up to, say, 10, then it would be exponentially bigger and therefore the result or the score would be exponentially higher. And so you could affect the fitness function like so. And then, so those are ways that you can use it to do multiple things is by using this gene pool. So some of the kind of examples that you can use it, this is something, some of the work that we've been doing in RCD. So this is a case where we have a building and there is restrictions on where you can put load. And so this is a script running a load takedown and uh, optimizing for where the location of the columns are by trying to avoid certain locations. I think there was tunnels. Was there tunnels, Paul? And so that's why it runs two tube tunnels, I thought it was tunnels, like so, so that's a way that you can use it to affect those things. Um, you can also use it for, and we've been using it for sort of generative mapping and scoring various options of masses that you come up in order to optimize for various things such as daylighting to wind effects to the amount of area that something has, um, like so. Or in other projects like this one, which is been recently using Galapagos to um, to optimize these two tower locations to see 
based off their viewport of how many of them can, or how the amount that each window can see the 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 sea. And so it's playing with the locations of those buildings and working out a score based off, you know, how much of the facade can see the ocean and then manipulating that to try and come up with an optimum position for each of those. There are millions and millions of different kinds of optimization techniques that exist. Uh, some of them have, have been made into various optimization plugins that also exist. So these ones do require you to go onto Food for Rhino to download, etc. Uh, so there's ones like Octopus, which allows for, it's very similar to Galapagos, um, but actually allows you to have multiple fitness scores separately rather than having to manually kind of combine them into one score. Um, Go, I forgot which one it does. Opossum does uh, various stuff with machine learning. I'm going to get these all the wrong way around. Uh, and then, like, Dodo does, some, there's some stuff on swarm particle options, and there's various ones. Essentially, there's, there's lots of different optimization techniques that you can use, and various um, plugins that all use it. And Another good one is uh, Biomorpha, which was created by an ex-Ramble RCD person who's now at the University of West of England, um, which is called Biomorpha, which is also a genetic algorithm, but it allows you to essentially score the unquantifiable. So what it does is, as you create your solution space, it brings up an interface which shows you all of your options visually and allows you to select some of them um, and be able to choose manually which ones you like or don't like. And so you're kind of able to quantify the aesthetic. If you like something aesthetically, you could say, yes, I like this, this, and this, and it will use that as your um, as you, the parents set for your next generation. And so it allows you to sort of score things which can't necessarily be quantified by numbers, and it's quite, so it's quite an interesting new new thing to go. And yeah, even though we started a bit late, so thank you. There's, uh, they're obviously very useful, and I give you a word of warning with these optimization techniques that I kind of explained briefly before, is that they don't necessarily give you the optimum perfect answer for everything. They sometimes can take a long time, and they may work for one aspect, but as you, <coughs> as you implement uh, various things, it may not be practical in some senses, especially in things such as uh, constructability, if you have multiple options which are all optimized for the perfect answer, may mean that in terms of fabrication and perfect constructability, that it's more impractical. impractical. So use these as a guide. Sometimes they can take quite a long time to reach the right answer, like this food thing, you Cheerios with vermouth and whatnot. Um, and it's also very much dependent on the rule sets and the fitness function that you give it. So you can, if you want to, very much tailor the score that you're wanting to uh, achieve, um, which can be beneficial or not. But yeah, that's that, I think, for genetic algorithms and Galapagos. Hopefully you can use it. Maybe you can use some of this in your, I don't know, when you're designing stuff now with beams, with your I values and whatnot, <laughs> maybe. Um, but yeah, there you go. Until next week. I'm not teaching it, so that's not, not a thing. Uh, so if you can't find Emily, you can wait.